you only get one childhood. If it's not a healthy childhood, the chance is lost forever. But how can nations of limited means with lower GNPs less development? With ethnic differences and geographical remoteness, still give its children a healthy start. The people of this land are holding a little secret of how that is possible. Under 125,000 square kilometers, fewer than 5 million citizens. And in that relatively small space, an unimaginable diversity of geography. Arid, remote mountains, temperate high-altitude cities, and desert at sea level. And for this land, 30 years of intractable conflict that hardened and shaped its people. A diversity of people as well, over nine ethnic groups and nine languages, nearly equal parts Muslim and Christian. This is Eritrea in the Horn of Africa. It ranks low in world GNP, so it is not wealthy. It ranks 106th in land size, so it is not large. 116th in population, so it is not crowded. Yet this small, newly founded nation has been, since 1991, tending to the health and education of its children in a remarkable way by supporting education and health throughout childhood and not waiting to take on problems later. Children, the first day, the first week, the first month, their exposure to danger exceedingly reduces by the days they leave. They must survive the first hour. Then they must survive the first day. Then the first week, then the first month, then the first year. But how? You can't put legions of doctors and hospitals in every remote village. You can't build a hospital in one year, you can't produce doctors in six months, you can't produce nurses in one year. But what they do have in place right now is teachers, thousands of teachers. And with a little training, they have become part of the national health team. A teacher is a teacher who teaches in the class, and at the same time a teacher is a social health worker in the school. They were trained as teachers at the same time, trained as health workers. The schools you know, are the perfect institution where the health people could come and intervene. Because looking after the health of the child you know, is looking after the health of the whole community. With just a little training, simple problems are caught while they still are simple and treated in local clinics while treatment is still inexpensive and easy. This way, the costly public health disasters of tomorrow are prevented. In the first place, you are saving the child. At the same time, the education given to this child is being transferred to the family, to the parents. And then the whole health sector is working in that school. It's also involved in mobilizing the whole community. So their message reaches the community via the school. During its war for independence starting in the 1970s, Eritrean fighters were locked in trench warfare in difficult terrain. Most of our service struggle, of course, in the most difficult and remote areas. So we were able to work with the most unable part of Eritrea, with the most vulnerable people of the population. Years of conflict created an extreme example of how to face education and health challenges. By necessity, the fighters developed a health and education system in tandem. School was established. I happened to, to be one of the founders of that school, the, the, Re the revolution school. We used to call it the zero school. It was the code name for it. The behind the enemy lines at the same time. And we were educating. We were printing our books there in the field. 
we, we didn't have shoes, so we started to produce shoes in the field. A pharmacy, a pharmaceutical factory was, was established out there. Uh, then we started training health care takers, barefoot doctors, inside the school, inside the zero school. We started training them. They are teachers. And the semblance of a government, you know, we complete with its uh, financial section, administrative section, so on, uh, developed out there. So we created what we call a, a very strong bond between the Minister of Health and the Minister of Education. Now, this went up to the, the time of uh, liberation. After independence in the early 90s, the bond between health and education stuck. And it stuck even in the very remote places where the war was fought. Places like this isolated mountaintop village in northern Eritrea. This village is called Hadish Adi and it is found within the elaborate Sabzoba. It's just up in the hills, it's one of the remote places that we have. From the main capital of Zoba, which is Karen, it takes between four and five hours to drive to the village. Which makes delivery of health services difficult. Fortunately, Hadish Adi, like all villages in Eritrea, has a school system, a kindergarten, elementary school, and secondary school. Here, like all of Eritrea, health and education starts before school does. You have the gross monitoring promotion where they weigh children every month and you follow and trace the development of that child. Whenever there are stone children and nourished, you know, you provide them with some vitamins and nutritional food. And for those who are badly in need, you take them to the nearest clinic center. Children whose weight falls behind what is expected for their age are given therapeutic feeding and monitored for progress. To help promote early child development, that monitoring follows children into kindergarten. Eritrea built 446 early education centers, including kindergartens, in just five years, and Hadish Adi is one of them. After kindergarten, the monitoring continues and early child development programs link seamlessly with school health programs into elementary school and beyond. For most, it is virtually their only contact with the greater community. The only institute that we have in such very remote areas are probably the schools. Even if they also focus on providing health messages and health services, then they can, they can make a big uh, impact on both the education and the health part. That means reaching every teacher in the country in every school, regardless of its size or location. This is Karen, and it's the nearest city to Hadishadi. And it is here that representatives from Hadish Adi's schools and every school in the area have gathered for training. Good morning. We are like giving uh, intense training on the basics of uh, provision of health uh, care for the child to teachers. So in all of the schools, we have a school health focal point person and the PTA representative and the school director. So that in our TOT uh, program, we train these people. This program is believed to benefit children uh, in the most remote areas with, which has a little access to health facilities. There are a number of uh, skin infections, the ring, the ring world, which we call it tosas. We have the invertigo, which, is, which we call it tok tokta and we have also the fungal infection. They are trained to screen children for basic health problems common to their area, as well as charting height and weight to make sure the children are healthy and growing. They teach prevention as well, nutrition, hygiene, HIV AIDS prevention and life skills. And when they go back to the school, they train the whole teachers. But first, it is important for each local community to buy into the program. 
so people like Samuel visit with teachers, parents and village elders to emphasize the importance of the program, answer questions and address concerns. The community at large are very happy when, when they found someone to visit the village with respect to this program, they give a maximum reception. They, are very, they, they will be very happy about it. Twelve-year-old Ristrum lives in Haddish Hardy. Like all the school children in this mountain village, he has a long, hilly walk to and from school. And when he's not feeling well, his ability to concentrate and learn can be affected. Fortunately, at Hadi Shadi's elementary school, his teacher is applying what he's learned in training. So in addition to the traditional school subjects, math, science, geography, languages, health education and continuing growth monitoring are part of the curriculum. We do this growth monitoring, or we measure stunting, which is an indicator for this cumulative malnutrition, so that teachers are trained to make regular growth monitoring for the school age children. And the other thing that we do is for skin, ear, eye, and uh, the dental problems, the infections. So that if they found any student with an eye infection or ear infection or skin infection, and even a dental caries, then they have to tell the child that he has to get treated early before it gets worse. And when the teacher examines Ristrum, he discovers why the boy is quieter than usual. He was found to have ear infection. So the teacher advised him to uh, get early treatment for the infection. And it's, he has also explained its seriousness, if not properly treated. So that the teacher gave him a referral form. That referral is free, and it goes home to his mother who now knows Ristrum needs to go to the nearest health clinic. His mom has immediately taken the child to the health facility for treatment. An ear infection is easy to spot and easy to treat with antibiotics. The treatment too is free and it is a good example of the kind of simple ailment that can be caught by a trained teacher early before it becomes serious. Had he not been supported by the teacher to go to the health facility, probably he may keep the infection long for a long time and it may get worse and worse and this may eventually lead to deafness. And Ristrum's experience is being replicated all over Eritrea. Asmara is Eritrea's capital and it is one of the treasures of Africa. And although it is 2,400 meters in elevation, this is no remote mountain village. It is a bustling cosmopolitan city. Asmara wears its history for all to see. It was colonized by Italy, occupied and influenced architecturally by Mussolini, who hoped to make Asmara the new Rome, and left it with a sleek modern look, unique in all of Africa. After World War II, British occupation gave way to incorporation with and annexation by Ethiopia until Eritrea won its independence in the early 90s. Through it all, Asmara has taken the best of all that has passed through. In Asmara, school children receive the same kind of basic health screenings that Ristrum School gives. Each class teacher is responsible for the health of the students in his class. And here, too, it starts in early childhood education and early child development programs and links with a school health program that continues through elementary and secondary school. In Ristrum's village, children who receive medical referrals go to the health clinic. In Asmara, the health clinic comes to them. This is the mobile health unit, a vehicle specially fitted for the kinds of basic health screenings children all over Eritrea are receiving. It would be impractical in rural areas, but for the close quarters of the city, it is a perfect fit. We contact the health focal teacher, and he brings the list of the, the students with eye, ear, and uh, dental problems. We have cards. We give free service in their schools. 
and what, as what we are uh, doing now. Today, the children at Free Salam are getting their teeth examined. Teeth that need to come out, come out on the spot. Focusing basic health care on young children can help learning now and avoid the need for more serious treatments later. But the idea is to get these people, get proper oral care younger in their life so they don't get infected when the bones are being formed. And once they get that habit, you know, they will continue to take care of it. But if somebody walks in when they are 20, 25, and the infection has spread through the whole mouth, there isn't much you can do. Meanwhile, eyes and ears are also checked. And again, all this is free. Vision problems are a very common cause of poor classroom performance. Many kids, they can't see the blackboard, but they don't know they can't see the blackboard. The teacher doesn't know that. They think this person has some mental defect or something, which they're not. They just can't see the blackboard because of simple eye exam. So we make sure that all have eye exams. If they have problems with eye glass, we do eye glasses. The specialists in the mobile health unit are able to examine children's eyes and provide eyeglasses right away. But as students leave elementary school and approach adolescence, the potential health problems get more complex. In asthma rafika, the problem is like, uh, for example, HIV, the smoking, drinking, things like the female genital mutilation, prevention of HIV AIDS, prevention of sexual transmitted infections, and other unwanted behaviors. How does an adolescent get through a complex set of obstacles like that? As an elementary school, the teacher is the key. Gebremadin Tekle Mesfun teaches at Semate Secondary School in Asmara. As school health focal person, my duty is uh, to follow school health activities and delivery service at school level, at the high school level. I have to train or to guide line the subject teachers or homework teachers as to how to screen the health status of students, as to how to deliver uh, certain uh, nutritional uh, materials to students. But with adolescents, adult authority figures are sometimes not enough to get the message through. It really gets boring when you're always lectured, you know, sex is bad, be careful. And when you're young, you tend to reject that. It's, you know, so many times do you listen to this nonsense? How to teach a teenager that it's not nonsense? The answer lies in the students themselves. It is, I think, wise to tackle problems, peer to peer, rather than teacher to students because when they sit together, the peers sit together, they can chat openly. Gebremadine knows that among teens, sometimes the greatest influence on behavior is other teens. And because he's the health focal point for his school, Gebremadine has been specially trained. We identify certain peers, influential peers, because of their influence within the class. They are most respected in the class. You will go to the, your peers and try to influence your peers, try to make them negotiate and discuss. Gebremadine helps identify the most promising peer educators from among some of the best students in the school. He then trains these leaders about the many life skills topics the students should cover with their peers, some of them previously taboo subjects. If you decide not to, to practice sex, should also stick in your decisions. My name is Haban Goitom. I'm in 11th grade in Samata Secondary School. I'm 16, going to 17. Haban is one of Gebremadine's most promising peer educators. Uh, Haban helped me uh, in my different uh, facilitating activities and in, in my different activities as a school health worker. The main challenge in this case study is the rape. The peer educa educators, we form a group and we have uh, a period of time that we discuss what we should do with our group, how to initiate our group, how to work with our group, what to do with our group. Haben works with 20 fellow students to spread the word. Peer education means uh, commencing or performing educational activities, health-related activities, 
value related activities and others through the peers. It is nice to influence the students through their peers rather than their teachers because they are not open to me. They are rather open to their peers. And while peer educator groups have both girls and boys, Gebremer Dean understands that some subjects are best tackled with just girls. That's why they participate in what's known as the Sara Club. Sara is a very common name in the whole world, and in fact in the whole Africa. It is found everywhere. And the Sara Club is named for a series of cartoon books where the main character, Sara, encounters many of the everyday problems of adolescent girls in Africa. And it is mostly cited to the feminine thing, to the female thing, like circumcision, marriage, to an unwanted marriage, pregnancy, rape, and related to that. The Sara storylines were specifically developed to demonstrate how girls can handle almost any life skills situation. We see the cartoonists, we read and learn the speeches in the cartoonists, how she solved her problem, problems, what challenges had she faced. And these comic books reflect what Sara is facing, what Sara is facing in her society, in her community, and even uh, in her school, in, with her peers and so. Because Haben works with 20 peers, her influence multiplies. Then through Haben, 20 students are influenced. These 20 influences, they will go home. They will influence 20 families. 20 families. And each family member will influence stepwise the community. There are about 10 or 11 more core elements of life skills like decision making, self assertiveness, self awareness, and etc. But my very favorite topic from all of them is empathy. I love empathy because it is like walking in somebody's shoes, looking through their eyes, and feeling what they are feeling. Part of Eritrea's Italian colonial history is the steam train that runs from Asmara down to Masawa on the Red Sea, and it shows vividly the transition between the capital and the coast. Within 50 kilometers, you go to zero altitude, so the change of both in, in altitude and, of course, in change of pressure, temperature, and the weather in general is dramatic. So is the change in culture. The Red Sea area, one of the hottest places on Earth, reflects the comings and goings of many important trade routes. Eritrea, it has got a strategic position on the Red Sea, where you can see an international way which is connecting the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean. But those who live just inland, in a region called the Northern Red Sea, are mostly Arab, Muslim and nomadic. That can make it hard to reach them with health and education services. Semenesh Kabedi is the health focal point for the Northern Red Sea region, and she understands the challenges in this unique place. Area, most of the parents, they are nomads. They don't have settled life. They move from one place to another place. During June, July, even uh, September, it's very hot in this area. Therefore, they migrate to the place where they can find water. Nevertheless, there is still growth monitoring and early child development even in these remote parts. Throughout the Muslim world, even the smallest of villages has a mosque, and the northern Red Sea village of Wikiro is no exception. But unlike many remote villages in the world, Wikiro also has a kindergarten, and its early child development programs start at the youngest ages. It continues into school health programs at elementary school. Adem teaches at Wikiro's elementary school. The school's combination of very basic buildings and traditional huts is a common sign of nomadic life. The families only live here part of the year, and this is not the only school they attend. 
Nevertheless, the teachers here get the same training from health focal points as any teacher in Asmara or Karen. We have trained teachers from every school. For example, in our Zoba, we have 105 schools. And every school director and one focal point teacher have taken training, have taken training in the school health program. And it's paying off. One school year, Adem noticed a girl named Bakita was struggling in school. She is an orphan. We are helping her from this school. I was her class teacher. At that time, she was very weak. She was very thin. The temptation for teachers is to write off such students as simply poor learners. If the child is not healthy, they will not attend the class attentively, will not grasp the, what you call absorb what the teacher says. But teachers like Adem, who are properly trained in health screening, can catch what the real problem is. The main problem in our area is anemia. Adem realized that Bakita's lack of energy was related to anemia. But a day-long trip to the nearest hospital in Masawa is not practical. Fortunately, the schools in the area share a basic clinic, just like the school in Hadish Adi. And the clinic bears out Adem's suspicions. They've reported that anemia is running at 14% in the area because the nomads subsist on a low iron diet. Bekita's anemia problem is treated with a free iron tablet. With such a straightforward solution, the entire region is given free iron pills. And every child must take about 32 tablets in a year. Because we have 32 weeks, academic weeks. And every week a child takes one tablet. In the case of iron, every class teacher gives his class. He can bring water here and we can distribute them. And if it's uh, used, is, it protects them from anemia, as well as the lost blood. The free iron pill distribution is just one part of the health and life skills education every student receives. Bekita's anemia is gone, and she is once more a high-performing student. Bekita is a very clever student you know, in the elemental level. She is following the teaching style in an exact way. Now, she scores the first, the first, the first in her class. She is not alone. Thanks to the iron pill distribution, anemia has dropped from 14% to 4% among children in the Northern Red Sea region. It just took a few iron pills and a little know-how. One childhood, precious and healthy. It is valued in Eritrea not because they care more than other nations or because they are any smarter. Eritrea succeeds at health and education from early childhood into adulthood because what normally would be rivalry between health and education ministries has instead been forged into an opportunity. If you train your teachers as health workers, eh, it is, becomes very positive. Therefore, the amount of money instead of producing health workers from the other side, teachers could be health workers at the same time. The question of health of education, the question of survival, it wasn't, it wasn't an option, or it's a nice thing to do, or uh, it wasn't a patronizing and, and do some, some requirement, but it was as a, such an ingredient of what we thought our country would be. It ingrained this into our population. And this is how we should live, that's how human beings should be treated.